So uh, we were talking about subgame perfect Nash uh, solutions of extensive form games. And last lecture we made an observation. Today we'll formally state that. But uh, before stating the theorem, let me remind you some of the definitions we had. So one was about perfect information. Uh, so an extensive form game Uh, game gamma is a perfect information game is a perfect information game if and only if every information set of every agent every information set That is a singleton. Is a singleton. That is consists of, contains only one element, which means that agents, when it's their turn to take an action, they know the actions of the agents uh, who took an action before them. Okay, that's what it means. Uh, I will not write it, but there's another concept called complete information, which is different when we say a game is complete information. It means that all the agents knows the rules of the game, the payoffs of the agents, and so on. That's something that we always assume, uh, at least in this course. We will assume that all games are complete information. That is, every agent knows the rules of the games in which order they take actions and they know each other's preferences over outcomes. Okay, but some games that we will study will be perfect information games, some not. Okay, so uh, I will write this shortly. Uh, an extensive form gamma is a finite game. Game if and only if every history is of finite length. Remember, a uh, history was a sequence of actions, okay? So that sequence should be, is, uh, should be of finite length. And there is a finite number of histories, which in summary means that when you draw the extensive form game, the game three, uh, there is a finite number of nodes. That's what it means for the game to be finite. Okay, So the theorem that we have is uh, every finite perfect information information game has uh, game has a uh, uh, Subgame perfect Nash solution. Okay. So that's an existence theorem for perfect information extensive form game, or the existence theorem for subgame perfect Nash solutions. If the game is a finite game, that is, there's a finite number of nodes, and it's perfect information, then that game does have at least one subgame perfect Nash solution. And we can find those solutions using the backward induction algorithm. 
I will not write that part. So all the subgame perfect Nash solutions can be found using the backward induction algorithm. Okay. I will not give the proof, but the idea of the proof, the proof uses induction, at least the one that I know uses induction. Uh, but the idea is basic. You look at the uh, histories at which an agent's action leads to a terminal history, terminal node. Well, if the game is finite, at that history, there should be a finite number of actions available to the agent. Well, then that's a one-person problem who has to maximize his payoff over a finite number of alternatives. And we know that that maximization problem has a solution. And using backward, we keep doing the same thing. At every history, we end up having a maximization problem over a finite number of alternatives. And because there's a finite number of alternatives, the maximization problem has a solution. Hence, the game has a subgame perfect Nash solution. OK? That's it. OK? So let's, let's do some uh, examples. Uh, actually, let's play a game. Uh, this is a game introduced by David Gale. Uh, it's played on a board. We can take the chess board. So let's take chess. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So that's our origin. The way we'll play it will take turns. I'll move first, and you'll move, and then I'll move, and then you'll move. So what we'll do is we'll mark a point on the board. So for example, if I mark this point, it means that you cannot mark any point on the uh, north east of this point. So you cannot mark points in this region. So the only place that you can mark is this region. And for example, if you mark here, then I cannot mark any region. So with each mark, the points on the northeast becomes unavailable for the players. Okay. So if I wanted to draw the extensive form game, what would happen? Well, first player one moves. And how many actions does he have? It's eight times eight. Okay. So 64, yep. Uh, and then player two moves. The number of actions available to him depends on uh, where the first player put. Okay. And we go on, uh, by the way, I forgot to say, uh, the player that does not leave any room for its opponent to play loses the game. That is, the player who moves, who marks this point, loses the game. Because if you mark this point, your opponent doesn't have any room to play. Okay. So we go, and then you know, player one moves, player two moves. And when we get to the hist uh, terminal nodes, what do we have? The payoffs are going to be either 1 minus 1, for example, where which denotes uh, is the numeric representation assigned to the outcome where Player one wins, player two loses. Or minus one, one. Player one loses, player two wins. Right? So this is a finite game. It's a large game, but still finite. It is perfect in formation. Okay. So it does have a subgame perfect Nash solution which we can find using backward induction. So if we go all the way using backward induction, you, we eliminate branches. And then at the end, we will be left with the beginning history, beginning node. And what can we have here? It could be, for example, 1 minus 1. It could be all 1 minus 1s. 
in which case it means that player one has a winning strategy. Okay. It could be, some of them could be one minus one, some of them could be minus one, one, which means that still player one has a winning strategy. Okay. Or it could be all minus one, one, minus one, one, minus one, one, which means that player two has a winning strategy. So in this game, one of the players does have a winning strategy. That is a strategy such that no matter what his or her opponent does, that player will win. Okay? So let's play the game. Uh, I'll move first, but I'm thinking uh, in the past, what I, uh, well, in the past, which means that about 10 or 12 years ago, because that was the last time I taught extensive form games, uh, I would first play it in the wrong way, then I will play it, I will play the correct in quotation strategies, but this time I'll start playing with the correct strategy. Okay. Uh, I mark this point. Now it's your turn to play. Which means that you cannot mark any of the cells in this region. What would you do? Actually, should I have asked, would you prefer being the first player or the second player? Who has the winning strategy? Yep. So give it in pairs, the first component tells the horizontal component. One, four, five. Okay, everybody agree? Which means that these cells are also gone. Now it's my turn to play. What do you think I'm going to do? Now it's your turn. You lost. <laughs> well, you have lost even before the game has started. So what is the winning strategy of player one? Exactly. Play the symmetric action of your opponent. Okay. So uh, you cannot use backward induction. It's a very big game to find it. But then with some analysis, you can see that player one has a strategy, and actually we do know what that strategy is. Now let's change this game a little bit. Erase one column. Again, the same idea applies. If we use backward induction, there would be two cases. Either there would be, uh, after the reduction, using backward induction after the reduction, there would be an action of the first player that leads to the payoff one minus one, which means that player one has a winning strategy, or, or all the actions would lead to the payoff minus one, one, minus one, one, which means that player two has a winning strategy. So still in this game, at least you know, one of the players does have a winning strategy. Who is it? What is it? It will do. First player is the first player. Everybody agree? Uh -huh. So, so that we have six, seven, eight. You want to start playing eight? You want to play this? OK, and then what would happen? But then who has the winning strategy in this case? Player two in this case. Which could mean that either player two has a winning strategy, or this is a bad opening move.
So why do you think it's player one? Okay. No? Player, well, again, your friend's suggestion means two things. Either player two does have a winning strategy, or that's a bad opening move. Because, you know, when you actually, if you leave a symmetric board to your opponent, Oh, the initial move of player? OK. So again, what would this mean? Either player two has a winning strategy, or the opening move 2-2 two -two is a bad action. No, but whenever uh, player one plays, if um, player two plays uh, a, mm -hmm. a, then player two will win. No, wait, wait a minute. So, Let's let me start. Actually, let me draw something smaller. Uh, the key is the game should it should not be symmetric. So what's the idea? Well, you cannot play on this. So if player one plays this cell, player two cannot play anything in this row. Yep? Well, so player, player one plays anything, and then player two plays? Yes. One five? Mm -hmm. And then imitate the action of player one. Uh -huh. wins. Player two wins. Yes. Okay. So again, let's let, let's repeat that. What does player one do? Anything. So. Okay. So player one played this. What does player two do? I play one five. One five. Okay. So then. When is player two's turn? Player's one's turn. Uh huh. You'll imitate them. You will not be able to do it because I'm going to move here. Yes? Well, the, the problem is if the game, if the board is not symmetric, you might not be able to imitate okay. the other player. OK, if you want, you can use the word. OK. Do you want to think about it a little bit? Well. What do you mean by the same place? So what do you do? First of all, so player one starts with? One, four. OK. It's not so. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. OK. So what does that imply? What is the conclusion that we get from that? Who, who, can, who can have the winning strategy? Uh, I think it depends on the number of lines. I see. It depends on the dimensions of the board. Could be. Could be. Does anybody have any other suggestions? Well, again, the first thing, yeah, the first thing is because of this theorem, we do know that there is a subgame perfect nice solution. And because of the payoff structure, that implies that one of the players does have a winning strategy. And what does that mean? 
no matter what the opponent does, he has a strategy such which will guarantee him a win. Okay? But this theorem doesn't tell what that strategy is and who that winner is. It gives you a method of finding it using backward induction, but in this case, it's not practical. Okay? So, do you have a comment or question? Any? Yeah? Uh huh. So, yeah. So the question is, is that possible? Okay. So if it is possible, then it will. It might guarantee player two. By the way, we don't know if the game is not symmetric. Player one has a winning strategy, but that could be an approach. Okay. Well, I claim that player one has a winning strategy. Assume that that was not the case. Well, we do know that one of the players has a winning strategy, so it must be player two, okay? Which means that if player one moved to this cell, the most northeast cell, there is a strategy, the restriction of the winning strategy of player two to this game will guarantee a win, no matter what player one does. Okay, but then why not use that strategy of player two? Why shouldn't player one use that strategy of player two? Actually, if player two has a winning strategy, which means that the restriction of that strategy to this subgame guarantees a win to player two, but then player one could use that strategy to guarantee a win, which contradicts with player two having a winning strategy, which means that player one must have a winning strategy. The question is, we don't know what that is. We do know that player one has a winning strategy because of this argument. Otherwise, it leads to a contradiction. But we do not know what that strategy is at least the last time I checked, we didn't know it. Okay, so in some cases we know the existence of an object. In this case, a subgame perfect nice solution, but we do not know what that is. Okay, well, chess is also a finite game. It's a perfect information game. The rule says that it has to end after a certain number of moves. So it does have a subgame perfect nice solution, which depends on, you know, depending on the structure of the payoffs that are, you know, the argument here. Okay. So we said, assume that player two has a winning strategy. Okay. Which means that if player one starts by marking this point, Okay. So then what do you have? Player one has taken an action. Then you have this subgame. The restriction of player two's winning strategy to this subgame, okay, take the restriction of player two's strategy to this subgame. Okay. Now, label all the twos a one, all the ones are two. That means that player one has a winning strategy. Or alternatively, let me put it a different way. As player one, I ask myself the following question. If I had started by marking this point, what would have player two do? Because he has a winning strategy, okay, he will be taking an action which will guarantee him a win. Okay, so then what would I do? Rather than marking this point, I will mark the point that player two would have marked if I had marked this point. Okay, that's the idea. Okay, which tells us that 
player one in this, even if the game is not symmetric, irrespective of the dimensions, okay, player one has a winning strategy. The problem is we don't know what that is. Okay? And that sometimes happens in mathematics. Yes, sir. Sorry? Starting with, starting with one form, maybe? Uh, I don't know. Well, with small games, you can write the game tree and use backward induction and solve it. But when it's you know, 8 by 7, it becomes very large. Uh, so as far as I know, even with the development of you know, high-speed computing and fast algorithms, they still don't know what that winning strategy is for games. But if you have, you know, two by three, I would recommend that, you know, draw the game tree for a two by three case, use backward induction and find the solution. Okay. But I wouldn't recommend that by, for eight by seven. Yeah. You'll require quite a bit of time and patience. Okay. Any questions? Any questions? So in some cases, you know, we do know that the game has a subgame perfect nice solution. We do have an algorithm to find it, the backward induction algorithm, but it's not practical to use it. But still, existence could be important. And in this game, the interesting thing is, we do know that player one has a winning strategy. The problem is, we don't know what that is. Okay. Any questions? Any questions? So uh, let's take a break. After the break, we'll look into Stackelberg model. And then we'll look into subgame perfect nice solutions of games, which are not uh, perfect information. Let's take a break. <laughs>